Hello and welcome. I'm Jake and this is Mysterious Planet, a show where we delve into some of the world's greatest mysteries, including the supernatural, scientific and archaeological mysteries, true crime and disappearances, conspiracies, and much more. Tonight on the show we ask the question, was Darwin wrong when he traced human origins to Africa? Joining us tonight on the show is one of the world's leading paleoanthropologists, who makes the claim that it was in Europe, not Africa, where apes evolved their most important traits attributed to human lineage. In this in-depth discussion, we are taken back in time millions of years to a primitive age long before the first humans, and even long before the existence of gorillas and chimpanzees, to an age where primitive apes that still had tails made their way out of Africa and into a place that we don't ever think of as being a home for apes. During this discussion, our guest will help us answer some very pressing questions. Who were these primitive apes? What did they look like, and why did they leave Africa? And what is perhaps the greatest unsolved mystery in paleoanthropology? All this and more on Mysterious Planet. Thanks for joining us. Alright, hello and welcome everyone. We have a very special guest here today on the show. He is a PhD professor of anthropology at the University of Toronto and specializes in paleoanthropology, comparative primate anatomy, and human origins. And he is the author of the book, The Real Planet of the Apes, A New Story of Human Origins. For those of you listening, be sure to check the video description for a link to that book as well as his other publications. He is here to offer his hypothesis on one of the most compelling questions ever asked. Where do we humans come from? Please welcome to the show, Dr. David Begun. Dr. Begun, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure to be here. All right, so doctor, first off, I'd like to talk about your book, The Real Planet of the Apes. Uh, Love the title, by the way. Uh, For those listening to this, would you mind going into detail about the origins of this book, the research behind it, and how you approached writing this book? Oh, wow. Well, um, the book came about as a result of my research over the last uh, 30 years almost, uh, working on uh, the fossil record of apes from uh, between about 20 million and 10 million years ago. Uh, But I was focused mainly on apes that lived in Europe. And that sounds weird because we know today that apes only live in Africa and in Southeast Asia, the orangs in Southeast Asia and the gorillas and chimps in Africa. But 10 million, 12, 14 million years ago, there were apes in Europe as well. And so I've been studying those guys for the last uh, 25 or 30 years. And I thought, well, I thought it was time to... uh, to tell the story of the apes from Europe because it was a story that people weren't that aware of. Uh, There's a much greater awareness of apes in Africa, but there are lots of fossil apes in Europe, and I wanted to talk about those guys. Hmm, Awesome. Yeah, I would definitely include myself in that group of people. Before I discovered your work, I always thought of the great apes being in, you know, only in Africa and Asia. Africa having the gorillas and chimpanzees, and Asia having the orangutans. So your work definitely introduced me to a new, fresh idea. Uh, So in the book, you question Darwin's conclusion that human and ape evolution occurred solely in Africa, this whole idea of Africa being the cradle of life, uh, stating that much of our ancestors' evolution took place in Europe. Uh, What was the key piece of evidence that first led you to form this hypothesis? Okay, we need to clarify something here. Humans definitely originated in Africa. In other words, the last common ancestor that we share with chimpanzees, our closest living relatives, was Africa. There's no doubt about that. What I am looking at is something that happened before that. I'm looking at the origins of the group um, of which we are a part, 
that is to say the African apes and humans together. That forms an evolutionary group called the hominines. And it is true that Darwin, as Darwin's preferred hypothesis was that chimps, gorillas, and humans originated in Africa. But he also said in his book, The Descent of Man, that it's possible that it might have happened in Europe instead because he knew about a fossil that had been discovered a few years before he published his book, the fossil called Dryopithecus from France, uh, that he thought may be an ancestor or some relative of African apes and humans. So we're, I want to be clear to everybody who listens to this that we're not talking about human origins. We're talking about the origins of our common, the group that we are a part of with chimpanzees and gorillas. Right. Well, cool, cool. Um, if you would, could you map out the timeline of your hypothesis from start to finish? Uh, in other words, from start to finish, what does your hypothesis entail? Sure. Okay. So... Uh, based on my analysis of the fossil record in Africa and Europe, what I think happened is that, well, we know that there are a lot of apes that lived in Africa between about 20 and 17 million years ago. And one of these apes um, was adapted to a wider range of uh the ability to exploit a wider range of, of food resources. It's an ape that's called Afropithecus that had large jaws and teeth. And it spread north. And we have a close relative of Afropithecus at about 17 and a half million years ago in Saudi Arabia. And then at around 17.3 to 17 million, we have a, a something that's similar um, in Germany and in and a little bit later on in Turkey. So it looks like this kind of ape, with its large jaws and its large teeth, was able to extend its range up into Europe, and it was the founding population of of apes that that lived in Europe for the next uh, 10 million years or so. And once they got to Europe, they diversified. They had what we call in evolutionary biology an adaptive radiation, into a wide number, wide variety of different forms. <clears throat> and one of these uh, became the ancestors of the African apes and humans. And we call them African apes because they only live today in Africa, but they actually originated in Europe. And these forms are the, the most well-known species, if any of your uh, listeners n- know a little bit about Paleoanthropology, the best known species is Dryopithecus, or genus is Dryopithecus. But there were at least a half a dozen. And they thrived in Europe in the subtropical forests uh, of Europe at the time. Europe was much wetter and much um, warmer than it is today. But eventually, uh, starting about 11 million years ago, 10 million years ago, in that area, um, Europe started to cool down and dry up, and the grasslands began to um, take over from where there used to be forests. And apes rely on forests because they're fruit-eating animals. They need to live in a place where you can get fruit almost all year long. Um... And so the apes were driven uh, back south, and uh, they tracked the forests as the forests were retreating to the south, and eventually they found themselves back in Africa. And once uh, these apes were back in Africa, they eventually split uh, into the three groups of apes that live in Africa today, the gorillas first, and then the chimpanzees and humans. So... That's the scenario that I have proposed, um, again, based on my analysis of, of thousands of fossils from Africa, Europe, and also from Asia. Wow, that's awesome. 
And as of right now, how is your hypothesis being received by mainstream science? Uh, I mean, do you, do you do you find that they're receiving this hypothesis with an open mind? I think the mainstream does uh, receive this idea with an open mind, and and I mean, I was approached by uh, the Princeton University Press, the who published my book. They asked me to write a book. I didn't approach them, so there was a certain amount of credibility that they found in my hypothesis. But I have to say that within the small community of people who work on fossil apes, the hypothesis has met with a lot of skepticism because people really prefer the idea that apes originated and evolved in Africa and the only ones that made it to Europe were sort of side branches that didn't really amount to anything. Right, right. Um, could you talk a little bit about how the two major groups of great apes, uh, African great apes and Asian great apes, how they split into two groups in relation to your hypothesis? Sure. So uh, I mentioned that uh, the apes uh, get into Europe at about 17 million or so. Mm-hmm. Um, probably around the same time, uh, there's a branch... While one branch of the apes are moving um, westward and northwestward into Europe, another branch is moving northeastward into Asia. And we we don't have uh, much evidence of this group from Asia <clears throat> until about 12 million, 12 and a half million years ago where we picked them up in South Asia, in India and in Pakistan. And these are the ancestors of the orangutans. So we have the ancestors of the orangutans in India and Pakistan, an area that is today very, very dry, very few um, resources that an ape could survive in. So it's a very different environment from the environment in which orangs live today, which is tropical rainforest. But that's where the ancestors of the orangs first appear we first know about them, anyway. Um, so there's this branching, there's this bifurcation. Um, we don't know exactly when it happened, but it was probably 16 or 17 million years ago with one branch moving into Europe and another branch moving into Asia. The Asian branch eventually evolves into orangutans and the European branch evolves into African apes and then moves back into Africa. 10 million years ago or so as the climate is no longer suitable in Europe. Ah, okay, cool. One thing I had to ask, uh, I'm really curious, seeing that you are an expert in anthropology, I wanted to get your thoughts on the recent discovery in Morocco of human fossils. Uh, For those listening who don't know about this, human fossils discovered in Morocco that were 300,000 years old, uh, essentially pushing our species history back 100,000 years. Uh, I was curious to get your thoughts on that discovery. Yeah. Now, we have to be careful here. So the Moroccan discovery is two to 300,000 years old, and it, and it refer, and it's about, um, or the, the specimen is referred to Homo sapiens, our species. Right. So 300,000 years ago, maybe a little older, um, I'm talking about not 300,000, not 3 million, but 10 million years ago. So right. we're talking about much, much, much older, before there were any humans, before there was Australopithecus, before there was Ardipithecus, before there was Sahelanthropus, all of the other things that came during the course of human evolution. This is before all of that. Right. So it has no bearing, and I want to really be clear about this, on the origins of Homo sapiens, the origins of modern humans, which is definitely in Africa. Right. This is about something that happened much earlier. And you might say, well, who cares? Um, it, to me, it's important, and it's interesting because it's like a crime scene, you know? It's like a CSI. You can't solve the crime unless you have the crime scene and you can gather evidence from the crime scene. And the crime scene is Europe. And it's in Europe 
that we developed our chimpanzee-sized brains, um, our uh, more vertical backbones, what we call orthograde, in other words, a more vertically positioned backbone, our suspensory adaptations, which means hanging below the branches instead of walking on all fours on your palms like a monkey does. Um, all of the specialized adaptations that we see in chimps and gorillas that are necessary precursors for human evolution, a tendency to have a larger brain, a tendency to grow a little bit more slowly and have a longer period of infant dependency, a tendency to have the vertebral column, the backbone oriented more vertically, a tendency to have more mobility in the shoulders. All of those things happen because of the circumstances that existed in Europe. And that's why it's important to, to know that. But, again, I really need to emphasize, because I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea, that this is before humans, it's even before chimps and gorillas evolved. It's the common ancestor of chimps, gorillas, and humans. And it wasn't until they that ancestor moved back into Africa that there was this separation and humans began to evolve in our own right on our own separate line in Africa. Right. And I understand that in your book, when you discuss the more distant past of apes that moved from Africa into Europe, you describe them, since this was so long ago, you describe them as very primitive. Uh, could you, for those who haven't read the book, go into detail about these primitive apes? Uh, you know, what, what was their appearance like and how are they different from modern apes? Sure, uh, that's a great question. So the apes that moved into Africa, into Europe from Africa, as far as we can tell, were like large monkeys. Um, they would have looked more like a baboon or something like that, uh, at least superficially, than an ape. So their arms and legs would have been roughly the same length, like a dog or a cat, and that's what baboons look like too. You know, chimps and gorillas have long arms and short legs, uh, and so do orangutans, all apes and gibbons as well. But these guys were more generalized. They, they had arms and legs of equal length. Their backbones were parallel to the ground, not more vertically inclined. Um, they had uh, relatively smaller brains than living apes, again, like monkeys. In fact, in many ways, they were similar to monkeys, except one important difference, which is that they didn't have a tail. You know, all monkeys have a tail. In fact, the vast majority of mammals have, at least terrestrial mammals, have tails. Um, monkeys have tails, even though sometimes you can't see the tails because they're buried under their fur. Most monkeys have pretty long tails. No, apes do not have a tail. They don't even have the bones, the equivalent bones for a tail. They have a totally different organization of that part of the skeleton. Um, and that's what this uh, early ape that we call proconsul or sometimes a kembo was like. It didn't have a tail. And that's important. It, again, it sounds like a trivial thing, but when you don't have a tail and you live in the trees, you have to compensate because the tail is, is used by a lot of primates as a rudder. Um, it shifts the center of body mass. Um, so you can stay balanced on the tops of branches or stay balanced as you're jumping from one branch to another. And if you don't have that, you have to have other adaptations. And in the case of Proconsul or Akembo, it was uh, very well developed to grasping capabilities in their hands, which again is probably a precursor to what came later with apes having uh, suspensory or hanging adaptations and very, very mobile uh, uh, upper limbs, very mobile arms. Right. And why was the tail lost through evolution? Well, that's a great question. Um, nobody really, nobody knows, uh, to be honest. There's no advantage to not having a tail that we've been able to discern. There could be something. It's not like it's easier to give birth or you, you change your pelvis so that 
something changes and you can say have larger babies or whatever there's no known functional advantage to not having a tail that that we have been able to discover there may be something that we just haven't figured out yet um but what we do know is that uh monkeys that the, the monkeys with the the shortest tails tend to have the most dexterous hands so they even monkeys that have they haven't lost their tails entirely but they've uh, their tails have reduced they tend to have larger uh, thumbs and more dexterous hands for grasping uh, so it's this compensation and it, it you know not everything in evolution happens for a functional reason there are things that are just accidents there are side effects of other selection so there might be selection for one thing and a side effect of that selection if you grow let's say you shorten shorten the the you, you decrease the number of uh, bones in your backbone which has happened during the course of ape and human evolution well a side effect of that might be to lose the tail and it might not have been something that was selected for and is functionally significant but it might be a side effect we just don't know Oh, okay. All right, so you mentioned Darwin before, and I wanted to get your insight on this. Did a hypothesis such as yours uh, exist at the time of Darwin? And if so, what was Darwin's perspective on it? Okay, so as I mentioned before, Darwin knew of one fossil jaw, a single jaw from France that was found in 1856 when he published his book, his second book on, on major book on evolution the descent of man 1871 he mentioned this this fossil called dryopithecus and he mentions it in just one sentence and he says as i mentioned before to paraphrase i think that apes african apes and humans probably evolved in africa because that's where they live today but there is this one fossil that I've heard of, that I know about, from Europe, from France, that does look a lot like a chimpanzee. And so there's a possibility that it might have happened in Europe instead of Africa. But that was it. It was kind of a throwaway. Uh, and Darwin is, is known for his hypothesis, and it's often repeated that Darwin was one of the first to speculate that humans and African apes originated in Africa. That's the second sentence about Dryopithecus is rarely recalled. So while it's definitely true that Darwin considered that as a possibility, it was not his preferred hypothesis. By far, he preferred the idea that African apes and humans originated. The African ape and human group, and again, I want to reiterate, humans definitely, as part of that group, come from Africa, but the origins of the group, he felt, was also African. Okay, interesting. Um, this is kind of a broad question, but besides the overall premise of your book, what would you regard as one of the greatest mysteries in paleoanthropology? <laughs> uh, wow, that's, that's a tough one. Um, well, we have no idea why humans became bipedal, for example. Um, you know, we can come up with scenarios about why our brains got bigger, These large brains have a clear adaptive value. There's no really obvious great reason to, for a primate to be a biped. I mean, there are you know, there are lots of bipeds that we call them birds, and they're all over the place, but they are very specialized, and they have wings. Um, there are no, uh, there are no truly bipedal mammals. You have kangaroos, but they're kind of tripedal, actually, because they, they balance on their tails, um, and it, and there are no, there are certainly no bipedal primates apart from humans. So that's a big mystery. Now, you know, people have come up with a lot of different reasons, carrying things, freeing the arms to carry stuff, 
frame the arms to use tools. But there's no proof of that in the fossil record. The first, for example, the earliest evidence we have for bipedalism is about seven million years ago. And the earliest evidence we have for the use of tools is about three million years ago. Now that doesn't mean that humans weren't using tools in that interval, but we don't have any evidence for it. So if they were using tools, they were using perishable tools that don't preserve in the fossil record, tools made out of wood or things like that. Um, or their tools were so crude that we just can't identify them when we find them. Um, so we don't know. There's no direct evidence that helps us to solve the mystery of why we became bipedal. Wow. Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's probably the biggest mystery. I'd say so. And so you said the first evidence we have of bipedal primates goes back to 7 million years ago? Right. Is that referring to Australopithecus? No. Uh, so that, the earliest evidence of bipedalism is actually indirect evidence. And it comes from uh, a genus called Sahelanthropus, which is known from Chad in Africa. And we don't have any limb bones that have been described for Sahelanthropus. Uh, but we do have a skull. And the skull um, has a... The base of the skull is, re, is, is organized um, such that... It looks like the neck came down directly underneath the skull. So if you if you think of a chimpanzee or even think of a dog or a cat, uh, think of a dog, for example. The dog's head is in front of its body. So you have the head, and then directly at the back of the head, you have the, the backbone, and it goes you know straight backwards. So there's an alignment a horizontal kind of alignment of the head and then the back. In apes, um, the backbone it shifts from being completely behind the head to slightly underneath the head. And then in humans, it shifts even more, so now the backbone is completely underneath the head and our head is balanced on the top of our backbones, right? Right. Um, and you can tell that by looking at the joint at the base of the skull that connects the head to the neck. And you can also tell by looking at the hole in the base of the skull through which the, the spinal cord passes. You have a, the base of your brain that exits your skull and then that turns into your spinal cord. There's a big hole, and in fact, it's, the name for that big hole is the Latin name for big hole, or foramen magnum. It's underneath the skull. And in humans, it's underneath the skull. It's, it's almost in the middle of the, of the bottom of the skull. Anyway, to make a long story short, that's where it is in Sahelanthropus also. So Sahelanthropus had a head that was balanced on the top of its vertebral column and not sticking out in front of its vertebral column. And the only reason that most people can think of why you would have that is if you had a vertically oriented vertebral column or backbone and your head was balanced on top of it because you were some kind of a biped. Huh. Well, awesome. And then three million years ago is when you said we see the first evidence of tool usage? Right. And what species that's, would that be? So that's Australopithecus. With, with Australopithecus, we have evidence of stone tools. Now... I need to be cautious here because there are a lot of people who question uh, whether or not this is really good evidence of, of tool, stone tools. Um, it's actually mainly not tools themselves, but marks on the bone that would have been left by using tools to deflesh um, uh, kills, for example, or to deflesh scavenged remains. Um, crushed bones that looked like they were crushed by tools. The jury is still out on whether um, that, that evidence is sufficient to be convincing that Australopithecines were using tools. If you want to go find the 
earliest unambiguous evidence of the presence of tools, it would be at about 2.8 million or so. And that is, we know that uh, the genus Homo uh, had come into um, existence by that time, and those tools are generally attributed to early members of our own genus, the genus Homo. Not Homo sapiens, the species, but an early form of our genus, the genus Homo. Oh, okay. And just to be clear, when we're talking about the evidence from three million years ago of marks being left on the bones of animals, are you referring to scavenging, uh, you know, dead dead animals that were scavenged by Australopithecus? Um, so this is another big area of debate in 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 Paleolithic archaeology. We don't know if the Animal bones found in association with early humans were those were uh, came from animals that the, our ancestors actually hunted and killed, or whether they're scavenged. Uh, we just don't know, and we have to keep an open mind about it. For many, many, many years, it was assumed if you found animal bones and humans that the humans killed the animals, but. Uh, you know, it was recognized uh, quite some time ago now that that might not be the case, that they might have been scavenged, they might have been even um, stolen from other predators. And uh, it, it does sound a little bit far-fetched, perhaps, to feel to think that 40 or 50 kilogram humans could scare away a pride of lions, but yelling and screaming and waving waving sticks and um, making a big ruckus actually does scare away lions and it's it's possible that uh, it's just as possible that at least some at least a significant percentage of the bones that we find in association with humans uh, were scavenged as were hunted I'm sure that some of them were hunted but on the other hand we do find uh, for instance, cut marks and crush and, and indications of bone uh, crushing on very, very large animals like rhinos and hippos that it's hard to imagine humans could have killed on their own. And so big things like that and elephants as well, yeah. really big animals like that is there's a good chance that humans were scavenging those things. Right. That sounds about right. Um, Awesome. Well, Dr. Begun, this has been a truly enlightening interview, and I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. Well, my pleasure. For everyone listening, please be sure to check out the description for a link to Dr. Begun's book, The Real Planet of the Apes, A New Story of Human Origins, as well as a list of his other recent publications. As always, I would greatly appreciate you spreading the word about this show, if you are so inclined. Be sure to also sign up for our newsletter for updates on new content. Link in the description for that as well. I hope to see you all back again. Stay tuned for more content. Thanks again for joining us. Good night.